Hey guys, this is Billy from adultcello.com and today I want to share my top four things they don't tell you about learning the cello. I started cello from scratch at age 25 and before I got started I did my fair amount of research. I was just super excited to get started and I also wanted to know kind of what I was in for basically. So I was reading articles and interviews with players and listening to videos and all this stuff. So what I'm going to share with you is kind of four topics, four ideas that kept coming up in my research back then and that I, I do agree with, but I think these topics are more nuanced. And so what I want to give you is kind of an in-depth understanding of these topics with my personal experience as an adult learner, shedding light on aspects that don't get covered quite as much. So let's get started. Please watch through to the end. I've kind of organized them from one to four in terms of increasing importance. And I'd love to know if any of these resonate with you. Please let me know in the comment section below. All right, so point number one is your health matters. So regarding your health, what they say is that you should stretch. You should be doing yoga. They warn you that the cello is full of repetitive motions and that it's very easy to get kind of like an overuse injury and it's taxing on the body. What they don't say is that diet also matters a great deal. For me personally, this is a huge topic of importance because when I was about six years into playing, I started to get tendonitis in my left pinky and a kind of a nerve impingement in my shoulder that was affecting my left arm. I did all types of body work to, to try to get myself recovered. I was doing physical therapy, I was stretching, I started doing yoga, I was doing Alexander Technique. All of these things helped for sure, but I definitely felt for months there like I was kind of hitting a wall you know, towards full recovery. Eventually, I looked at my diet and I started eliminating refined sugar wherever I found it. When I did that, within two to three days, my level of inflammation in my body felt like it went from here to here. So I totally understand why they talk about stretching. It's, and it's true, you know, you're like using your body constantly and you have to take care of your body physically so that it doesn't break down on you. But I think it's really important to understand that, especially if you're gonna be practicing consistently like you should be, you're asking a lot of your body and your body is kind of like a machine and you need to fuel it in a way that's gonna get it optimized for performance. It's pretty much an understood thing now that, that sugar uh, promotes an inflammatory process in the body. And especially if you're starting to battle any of those kind of inflammations, any itis, basically tendonitis, you know, the inflammation of the tendon, that, that sugar is like the last thing you want to be putting into your body because it's going to promote the very thing you're trying to get rid of. So please don't forget the fact that diet can play a major role in how your body feels and its overall health. Point number two, growth is nonlinear. So what they say is that to have a fruitful cello journey and to make progress and to really see results, you need to put in consistent work. What they don't say though is that your growth as a player is not going to be linear. In my experience, this is incredibly true. One thing that's been consistent throughout all this is my approach to practice. Whether I decided for months and months to, I was going to do at least two hours a day, at least three hours a day, four hours a day, I was very consistent in my daily approach and I almost never take days off of practicing. I'm <laughs> almost one could say obsessive. You would think that, okay, well, I'm putting in four hours a day. I want, I should be seeing four hours a day of progress. That's very much not the case. If you looked at my journey, um, kind of a, like zoomed in with the camera, it, it wouldn't be just kind of a linear ascent like this. It's pockets alternating between, you know, plateaus where something's kind of stuck and then growth spurts where suddenly new things are happening and it's really exciting. So overall, if you zoomed way out, maybe it would look kind of linear, but really day to day, week to week, it does not feel that way at all. At least it hasn't in my case. If, so why I mention this and why it's important is that if you're learning cello and you're at the start of your journey, you're probably gonna feel like you're making great progress. I mean, the, if you put 100 hours in, you went from no hours having ever played to 100 hours. That's huge, that's such a difference. However, if you've now put in total over your lifetime, let's say 2,000 hours and you add another 50 hours, you can see where that ratio is not really a big addition to your total experience. And that's where the plateaus start to come in. 
I think a lot of adults start hitting these initial plateaus maybe a year in, six months in, whatever. And, you know, if you're only reading that consistent work is what it takes, you can start to think, you know, maybe I'm kind of hitting a wall. Maybe this is, I'm just not talented enough or, or this is not, yeah, I don't want to just keep playing like this. And it, you, I just want to reiterate that three hours of practice time is not always going to equal three hours of progress. So you just kind of stay consistent. I totally agree with that, that consistency is key, but don't expect consistent results. Now, I will say the silver lining, especially earlier on in your journey, if you have one of those days where you sit down and get one of those aha moments where something in the bow hand, like maybe something in your grip totally changes, just suddenly, instantly you feel like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. You might sit up, you know, stand up from practicing after only an hour and sound like six months down the road because just that one little change made a huge difference in the way you sound and the way you're playing. So it goes both ways, but just beware of plateaus. It doesn't mean you've, you're totally on the wrong track or that you're completely stuck. Sometimes you just gotta plow right through them. Number three is that learning the cello is not all rainbows and butterflies. What they say is that, you know, I see this a lot, especially people who teach adults, they'll say, you know, it should, it should not be a stressful thing to learn how to play cello. You should find a way to enjoy it every day, but also you should be setting goals, okay? What they don't say is that at times, cello can be a little stressful, very frustrating, and not really enjoyable. <laughs> and that's just, that's the truth, okay? So in my experience, I've had so many moments where I'm frustrated to the point of like true anger, and I just am so stuck and annoyed. Why I wanna share this is that I think <laughs> if you're someone who's starting to learn cello and you're being fed this information about, you know, that like this is the kind of thing that like de-stresses your life and then you're practicing and and you've been told to set goals and maybe even with like a time stamp on it like you're going to have a performance coming up in two months i want you to play this piece that today right now you can't play there's going to be some stress involved because you need to hit a goal to me that's a great thing but if you're not expecting stress or frustration you're just kind of being lied to and it, it, it could turn you off because, okay, so maybe some people like this. I, I don't, I'm not enjoying this right now at all. And so you just kind of lose steam and give up. I understand why people say that. Um, and I, of course, you should try to enjoy whatever you're doing. But I think it's a kind of a symptom of trying to sugarcoat the experience and sort of gloss over the hardship that's involved with learning something as difficult as the cello. I don't think it's a great idea to do that and not give a full picture. For example, I, I also do ceramics and I've recently jumped right back into it. Um, you know, I was watching the instructor at the class I go to and she was teaching someone how to, you know, center clay on the potter's wheel for the first time. That is the, one of the first things you have to do is learn how to center clay. It's not easy. And one thing I appreciated was that the teacher at no point was she trying to say, you know, like, yeah, you should just enjoy it. Like, you know, you're struggling really hard and it's, the clay is just, you, after 25 minutes of pushing on this clay, it's still got this horrible wobble. Like, of course you're not gonna enjoy that. And I think there's an element with the cello also where you should just expect that, you know, if you're, if you're kind of rubbing up against a, a limitation, you can expect to be a little frustrated and maybe not enjoy a day, two days, three days of practice in a row, but it's about the big picture and it's totally, totally worth the effort to, to kind of battle on and, and get past these, you know, temporary hardships. The only thing I'll say in terms of that is that if you feel like you've hit a plateau in your progress and you're really not enjoying yourself and it's been months and months, that's when you can go ahead and start maybe looking for an external change, like maybe switch teachers, you know, do something to kind of spur, spur some growth, like get something going. Finally, number four is you can make a great sound today. Okay, so what, what they say is that it takes years and years just to make a beautiful sound on the cello. What they don't say is that on an open string, for example, you can make a beautiful sound on your first day of learning to play cello. In my experience, you know, I talked about doing a lot of research as a someone who's getting ready to play cello. 
I ran into this sentiment over and over again about how hard it is. It got me excited to learn because I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. You know, it takes years just to make a beautiful sound. Unfortunately, the other thing it did was kind of brainwash me into doing this self-fulfilling prophecy where I, I just didn't feel qualified to even try to make a beautiful sound because I know it takes years and years. I've only been playing six months, like who am I to try? So I would just prioritize other things, you know, left hand, being able to play notes and play harder and harder pieces. And I just kind of shelved the idea of making a, a really beautiful sound because it just didn't seem like something, it, it just kind of happens eventually over, after a bunch of years, you know, but I'm not ready to try for that yet. My second bachelor's, I had my recital, senior recital, and I played, you know, first movement of Dvorak, I played the entire rock monodot sonata, a whole box suite, very challenging. And I, for where I was at the time, I kind of knocked it out of the park, but when I got home, I remember just feeling like really deflated and just kind of like, I don't think anyone would have paid for that. And I mean, in that case, did I really even play it? Even though I got the notes right and the right rhythm. It, and I figured out later on what I was feeling was just that I just don't like, I didn't like the sound I made. Like fundamentally the beauty of sound just wasn't there. And so no matter how hard a piece I played, it just wasn't exciting or fulfilling because I didn't like how I sounded. This happens with my students a lot in the sense that I'll get a student who comes in and I kind of am getting their background and they're telling me about where they are. A lot of times I've had students come in who are already playing kind of intermediate level pieces and considering how long they've been playing, it, it's pretty impressive. You know, they've made good progress, but they're also kind of toying with the idea of quitting cello altogether. And when I ask, it's always the same thing. I just don't like how I sound. So who cares if I'm playing hard pieces? I hate the sound I make. I'll just talk about one thing I do, and this is like a little exercise I do just to prove that you don't have to have a really advanced understanding of cello technique to make a beautiful sound. So what I do is I, I use what I call the barbaric grip, okay? And so I, may, I hold the, the bow basically like I'd hold a baseball bat. So totally wrong compared to normal bow grip. Got the fingers under the frog, and I got the, the thumb just wrapped over the fingers, and the first finger is just kind of hanging on. And it's, it feels very secure, but it feels, you know, I, my fingers are basically useless this way. But if I then try to make a beautiful sound with an open string, you really have to focus on your arm and just kind of sinking the weight in and trying to open the sound with your arm instead of your hand and your fingers. <laughs> And after doing this exercise on the various strings, oftentimes my students will say, you know, that's, I've never had a string kind of sound that open and resonant. And to me, that's reminiscent, rather, of how I felt. But it also is kind of a bummer when I hear that, because you could have been focusing on how to make a beautiful sound early on in your journey, and how much more exciting would it be to, to love the sound you're making right away versus kind of thinking, ah, oh, you know, someday I'll my time will come, but for right now, I just kind of have to like scratch my way through <laughs> the repertoire. So I understand why they talk about it taking years and years to make a beautiful cello sound. It's, it's true. I mean, there's, you know, there's aspects like vibrato and matching it with bow speed and all colors you can pull, very advanced things that do take years and years. But what I would say is beware of just reading that and then deciding you're gonna shelve making any type of beautiful sound and just focus on other things because it really will be a detriment to your, I think, to your enjoyment of the, of the journey and your excitement to make more cello sounds. In my course, Cello in 30 Days, I talk about making a beautiful sound on day one, and it's because I really believe that if you make that a focus, given whatever level technically you're at, you're gonna be more excited to play cello if you're really excited by the sound you're making. So those are my top four things they don't tell you when you start learning the cello. Uh, in the comments below, please let me know which one of those resonates with you. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much.